Welcome to FWA Review this week. We've got Darren Lewis of The Mirror and the FWA National Executive now writing a column in the news pages of The Mirror. This is a, a departure for you, Darren, but it's a, it's a very positive move. And this week was really all about the, uh, the pitch invaders, the crowd yeah. things that have ruined this weekend's football. Isn't it? It's a real irony, really, isn't it, that um, you end up writing about something connected with football. That actually is quite sad to do with football as well. Uh, but it was quite necessary because obviously people, um, I think everyone is appalled by what we saw at the weekend and everyone is concerned about how we're going to deal with it. Mm. And the answers don't appear at first glance to be obvious, but I do think that if there is a collective show of strength by uh, the authorities, that the clubs may be galvanised into taking some effective action. Everything other than that is just all talk. And I think um, football is very good at that. And I think what we need to see uh, very quickly is some action. You said zero tolerance. That's mm. pretty dramatic. But do you think that's what would really start to make a difference? Well, if you think about it, I mean, we've both... I've been in working for the Daily Mirror for 20 years. You've been uh, in the industry for longer than I have. For five decades, six decades, whatever. Longer than that. We have not had any solutions to the problems that we've had, certainly since I've been growing up and a lot of people watching this will have seen problems that there hasn't been a solution to and yes, self-policing has been great in eradicating some problems, but have they really eradicated them or have they just pushed them to the margins because they're coming back and at the moment there isn't really uh, any way through what is a big problem and I actually think as the problems outside of our industry get worse so the problems within our industry will continue to grow unless we actually take a zero tolerance approach and unless we're prepared uh, the authorities are prepared to put pressure on those clubs to take that zero tolerance approach. Mm. I mean it's, it's often said it's a problem in wider society in general but it's highlighted particularly because football just gives it that bigger stage, bigger platform, Absolutely. and it's up to football to start sorting that out, isn't it? I, I think so. Football only can deal with what it can control, you know, to a certain extent. I do agree. It is a problem with the wider society. But if somebody knows that they could be hurting their club with the way that they behave at a football ground, if they know that there are points that could be docked, if they know that their club could be performing behind closed doors because of their actions, and maybe then, sorry, maybe then, they're... they're you know, we saw the other people in the crowd cheering when that guy was led off mm. uh, at Birmingham. If they knew there were points at stake, if they knew they could put themselves in relegation trouble as a result, maybe there would be a change in the way they behave. Maybe they wouldn't be so willing to condone what he has done. So I think there are punishments that we can put on clubs that will make them realise and make fans realise we can't go to football grounds and behave that way. Mm. I mean, we're here at St George's Park, the home of the FA, uh, Gareth Southgate's been talking about it, and and obviously, you know, a generation ago, England's fans were were international pariahs. That's that problem had gone away to a large extent, mm. or certainly was cleaned up. And self policing was a big factor, wasn't it? Good policing mm. and self policing. You know, Absolutely. the 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 fans didn't want to see that anymore. The mm. good fans, and uh, and I think you know maybe that is the way forward, isn't it? A combination of strong policing and self-policing. Yeah, uh, to a certain extent, but I think people uh, self-policing can only go so far uh, because, and let's be real here, we've got the problems of alcohol, we've got the problems of drugs, we've got the pe problems of people operating within a society where uh, there is almost a lawlessness and an unwillingness to follow the rules, and uh, and so to some extent self-policing can only go so far because people want to be able to protect their own safety. And so what then happens is you rely on the people whose job it is to enforce mm. That's not stewards, uh, Jerry. You know, stewards get paid a certain amount. They've had a lot of criticism this week, but I'm telling you, if I'm a steward, I'm not going to put myself in harm's way for £10 an hour, £12 an hour. People talk about better training. You can give stewards all the training you want. Their job is not law enforcement. And I think increasingly in football grounds, that's what you're talking about, law enforcement. So uh, for me, I, I think, yes, self-policing, great, but I do think there is a big responsibility on the football clubs to be able to take control of these situations. Now, on a far more positive note, uh, anyone, any one of us last night lucky enough to be at uh, the Etihad seeing another sparkling display by Man City and, and Raheem Sterling in particular. Mm. He's, he's really come to the fore, hat-trick last weekend, the, the winning penalty, which showed tremendous bottle in the mm. Carabao Cup final, 
he's already been talked about as one of our front runners for the FA, uh, FWA Footballer of the Year. Um, and Gareth was just talking about him very glowingly about his maturity. And he's had another good season. Just assess where, where Raheem is at the moment. He's growing rapidly in stature as a footballer. And I'm quite glad about the numbers that speak for themselves as far as he's concerned because it shows that to talk about him as a potential footballer of the year isn't to patronise him, isn't to talk about him in those terms because there is this movement towards recognising uh, that black players aren't getting the credit they deserve. The numbers are doing the talking, the performances are doing the talking. The ability to respond to pressure in big situations mm. is doing the talking. And that's what we have to judge him by. We can be impressed by what he's got to say. We can be touched by the fact that his social conscience is so strong. But at the end of the day, he's a footballer. And he has to win the Footballer of the Year award on merit. That's what he would be doing if he were to succeed. Obviously, Virgil van Dijk is a huge rival uh, to Raheem Sterling. I think it may well be that whoever goes on to win the title or the Champions League should either do that, may well have a stronger case. Uh, but either way, I think that an award won't be necessarily the barometer uh, for our the, for the for the impression that Sterling has made on us. I think you can't judge that with the Footballer of the Year award. I think what Sterling's done this season will stand for seasons for years to come. Mm. You know, he's inspired a generation. He's lifted people outside of the game. He's given other black players a voice. We've seen now Lukaku talk out, come out and speak about the way that he feels he's perceived. Black players are doing what they haven't been able to do for decades because they've been worried about the reaction. Now they're realising their value, their power. And for that, you have to say that you know, Sterling deserves immense credit. Mm. And of course, that team, that City team at the moment, uh, they've got every reason to believe that a quadruple is possible. They've Absolutely. got one, one already. They're in a very strong position in the, uh, in the Premier League race uh, against uh, Liverpool, which is now a two-horse race. And we'll find out on Friday the draw for the, for the Champions League. In the FA Cup, again, they're in a good position. So could they do it? I think it's incredibly tough. I, still, because there are some very good teams left in the Champions League and I think City, as well as they've been playing, the confidence is back and the verve that they're playing with, that they've had played with in the early, uh, first half of the season, that's back as well after a slight blip. But I think you still have to respect the quality and the calibre of the other teams in the competition. You would make them favourites to win the FA Cup but you can never le legislate for another team. Listen, we can beat Manchester City yeah, in absolutely. the FA Cup final. Yeah. And I think when a team like City are playing so well and carrying all, all before them, it's very easy to start talking about that, but that would maybe underestimate some of the teams they left. I'm not suggesting Guardiola or any of his players would do that because you talked in the press conference, Guardiola, about what he didn't see from Lee Raisani, for example, mm. in the first half, what he didn't see from uh, Raheem Sterling in the first half, the aggression that he wanted them to maintain throughout the 90 minutes, not just in patches. He still recognises that he his men can't get carried away. Um, I wouldn't get carried away enough to talk about a, a quadruple just yet. I think they are very good, strong competitors in all four competitions, but I think they're still, well, obviously they've got one already, but I mm. think um, as far as the quadruple is concerned, I'll just hold fire on that for a bit. And then finally, we've been here today, England's squad announcement. The big news, really, the headline news, is Declan Rice mm. being called up. Um, controversially, obviously, that he played for Ireland, chose Ireland, and now has chosen England. Um, he wouldn't have done that if he didn't think he had a really good chance of establishing himself as a mm. top player with England. Gareth seems to think he's got what it takes to make it, but obviously we've yet to see on an international stage if he can do it in an England show. It's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, Manuel Pellegrini at West Ham has talked in glowing terms about Declan Rice, compared him to the likes of Fernandinho, no less, mm. uh, who he obviously he managed. And I think as far as... Uh, an England shirt is concerned, I think that it will not weigh heavy on the shoulders of Declan Rice. I think he'll acquit himself well. I think he's a very, very capable performer who will enhance the England team, which is in rapid transition because there are so many players pushing for a place in that squad. You think about the players who are not in this squad. 
Wan Bissaka. You know, James Ward Prowse has been playing well uh, recently. Uh, we still got other exciting players like Callum Hudson Odoi who could get into the mm. squad and make an impact. And uh, so it means that the players who are in the squad, they have the incentive to work hard, to perform well on a consistent basis, to maintain their places within this squad. Declan Rice will go in and he will enhance this England team. You only have to look at his performances for West Ham to know that. And also you only have to look at his performances to realise he has a huge future. I think you and I will be writing about Declan Rice for years to come in England terms because his ability and his performances will warrant that. And actually, it's quite exciting, uh, the next couple of games coming up, to see uh, the kind of performances that he will produce. Uh, hopefully, they'll be positive. And hopefully, uh, yeah, we'll be talking about him uh, going to major tournaments, starting, obviously, with this summer and doing very well. Darren, thanks for your time. Thanks for watching FWA Review this week. And uh, keep coming back for more. <laughs>